Um, this is a lecture about Niccolò Machiavelli and his best-known work of political theory, The Prince, Il Principe. But I want first to say a word about Machiavelli himself. A Florentine, born 1469, he first of all devoted himself to a life of public service. And it's an important fact about his biography that he wouldn't have expected uh, in his earlier years to have been the author of any work of politics. He devoted himself as I say, to the service of the Republic, and he was indeed second chancellor of the Florentine Republic from 1498 until the sudden collapse of the Republic and the return of the Medici princes to power uh, in 1512. 1512 was a great year of crisis for Machiavelli. He was not only summarily removed from his position in the second chancery, but he became an object of suspicion to the Medicians, alleged to have taken part in a plot against the return of the Medici princes to power, and he was imprisoned and tortured. He is released from prison in a general amnesty at the beginning of 1513, but he is ordered to absent himself from the city. He is in compulsory exile from the city, living in his farm south of the city, overlooking it, but he's not permitted to re-enter that space. And that is the end of his public career, tremendous division in his life, 1512, because from that time onwards he has no public role, no political office, and becomes the man of letters, the philosopher of politics, whom, by, uh, who is known to posterity. Now, settling down early in 1513 in the countryside, in enforced leisure, which he hated, he writes a, a famous letter to his friend um, Vettori, uh, Francesco Vettori, in December of 1513, in which he says, well, how have I been occupying this enforced leisure? He says, well, I have just finished writing a little book, which is De Principatibus, concerning principalities. Now, if Machiavelli began writing that little book, as he implies, as soon as he was let out of jail, then he began to write it exactly 500 years ago to the month. So it's this date, it's a great anniversary for Machiavelli scholars. So now let me turn from Machiavelli to his text, to the Principe. As I'm sure you know, there's a pivotal chapter in this book. It's a book of, what, 26 chapters, the last being this formal rhetorical exhortatio to the Medici to restore Italian unity, but the previous 25 chapters being this analysis of how to gain and hold power. The pivotal chapter, I think, is chapter 15, in which Machiavelli declares that his aim in writing the book is to offer practical advice about statecraft. And his basic aim, he says at the end of the book, is, this is chapter 24, to offer advice to new princes. He's not interested in uh, established princes. If you've inherited your principality and you can't hold on to it, then you're too incompetent to be worth thinking about. He's only interested in new princes who have the greatest difficulty. And the aspiration, as he nicely puts it, is to make new princes look like well-established ones. That's the practical aim of the advice. Now, he discusses rulers of antiquity and rulers of the present time, both as sources of exemplar. Of course, the, the idea of operating with examples as much as with arguments, very typical feature of uh, Renaissance rhetorical culture. So, as you would expect, no doubt, uh, all the princes, all the political leaders whom he discusses in antiquity and in his own time are men. Um, and that means that the vocabulary of the prince is quite a heavily gendered vocabulary, and not to be anachronistic, I'm going to um, have to follow it. But let's notice at the outset that not all the rulers whom Machiavelli discusses were, in fact, men. One whom he mentions with great admiration, both in the Principe and later in the Discorsi, is a woman, Caterina Sforza. And as we shall see, everything that he has to say about the requisite qualities for political leadership would apply to women rulers as much as to male rulers. Now, there is one indispensable quality, or rather set of qualities, that any political leader, man or woman, any political leader must possess, according to Machiavelli, if they are to succeed in their leadership. 
And this is the quality which in the Italian is called virtù. Now this word, la virtù, it's the same in the plural, le virtù, echoes throughout the book. It occurs once in Latin. As perhaps you know, of course, the book is in Italian, but the chapter headings of this book are in Latin. And chapter 6 has the Latin form, virtus. Um, that's the only occurrence of it in Latin in the whole text. But it, for those who like precision, the word virtu, either in the singular or the plural, occurs 60 times in this extremely short book. So that's an average of getting on for once per page. It's absolutely pivotal to the argument of most of the chapters, this notion of princely virtu. And so correspondingly, it seems to me, the pivotal task of the interpreter of this book is to understand what he meant when he used that crucial term. Now, Machiavelli never supplies a formal definition. That's not his way. He's not Hobbes, as it were. Um, and it's true to say that he uses the, the, the term virtu in a quite wide variety of contexts, so wide that it's become quite standard to say in the critical literature, uh, I quote, for example, Whitfield, that he uses the word without any consistency at all. Now, the first point I want to make is that I really don't agree with that. It seems to me that this term, pivotal to the argument, is used with complete consistency. It is applied throughout this brief book as the name of a set of qualities which Machiavelli wants to say several things about. I, I think I'm going to turn out to, to make four closely connected points here about how this terminology is in fact used. First, la virtù, virtù is said to be the name of the quality, or rather it's always a set of qualities, by means of which it is possible for a political leader, at least in part to control, and hence to offset, the power of fortuna, as he calls it, the power of luck, good luck or ill luck, in political affairs. I should say, and this I'm sure you'll know, Machiavelli believes that you could never get rid of the element of luck in political leadership. So, as he frequently implies, show me a successful political leader and I will show you someone who has been extremely lucky. I mean, what if John Smith had not had a heart attack? We would never have heard of Tony Blair. Wow. I mean, these people are fortunate. They're, they're, they're successful only because they're fortunate. But, of course, although there the therefore cannot be a science of politics, I mean, that would be a grotesque mistake, according to Machiavelli. There couldn't be a science of politics, because that would forget the role of luck in politics, which is ex hypothesi, incalculable, but of great importance. Nevertheless, he says it's a great mistake of some ancient thinkers, and he cites Plutarch, to suppose that in politics everything is luck. For Machiavelli, much of it is judgment, and the relationship between luck and judgment is really one of the major themes of the book. Now, the quality that you have to possess if you're going to be able in any way to control the role of luck is virtu. And so one of the oppositions in the book is always between la virtu and la fortuna. Fortuna virtu. That comes out most explicitly in chapter 24, this concluding chapter on how the political leaders of Italy have, in his own time, so commonly lost their states, lost their principalities. And Machiavelli says, they blame Fortuna. They say this has been due to tremendous ill luck. But he says, and I quote, all these quotations are my own translations, by the way. Me, my translations are very literal. Um, Where one's defences are based upon one's own virtu, the capacity of ill fortune to take away one's power is limited. So although they, they blame what they regard as their ill luck, they ought not to do so. Why not? Because in fact, they're lacking in virtu. If they had this quality, it would have enabled them to offset, to control, to some degree, ill fortune. Now, there's the first claim. The second is a very closely associated claim, which is that la virtu is also the name of the set of qualities which enable you... This is a kind of very useful, I think, uh, um, American idiom, which captures very well what Machiavelli is saying. You can get lucky. It's possible to get lucky. You shouldn't think of, of fortuna as the same as providence. It's not inexorable. 
it, it's possible in certain ways to ally with and to control fortune. Um, and if you ask, well, by what means is it possible? The answer is, again, la virtu. And this is the point that's brought out in chapter 6, which is in opposition to chapter 7, where the first discusses how you can seize and hold power by this quality of virtus, and the second discusses how you can do the same by means of fortune. So now these two qualities are being put in opposition in the organisation of the first part of the book. Now, in chapter 6, Machiavelli introduces another notion here which is connected with fortune. He says, sometimes, I'm quoting, you may have the good fortune to encounter the right uh, occasion. The, the Italian word is occasione. The, the, the right, we would have to say, moment of opportunity uh, to act. And he says, if you're not blessed with having the right opportunity to act, if you don't have that kind of fortune, and that is a piece of good luck, having occasione, having the right moment to act, then you're never going to succeed as a political leader at all. So to that degree, fortune is inexorable and present. But what it is to be a leader of Virtu is to seize opportunities. That's the quality that enables you to seize opportunities. So, in chapter 6, he follows this thought out with the discussion of the leaders, the three leaders whom he regards as having had the greatest virtu in the history of political leadership, Moses, Cyrus, Romulus. Well, Moses, he says, he cheated because God told him what to do, so that really doesn't count. Um, his favourite is Romulus, but of all of them, he says, and I quote, if their lives and actions are examined, it will be seen that they received from Fortuna nothing but occasione, nothing but the right circumstances in which to act. He agrees, without having had that particular occasion, um, their virtue would have been expended to no effect, but because they had such great virtue, no opportunity was wasted. And that was what made them successful political leaders. They grasped the opportunity and the quality that enabled them to do so was their two. Now, that brings me to the third of these four points I'm trying to make about this concept, um, which is also brought out in chapter six. Because, he says, political leaders with these qualities of their two are always able to seize opportunities they are in turn able, and now comes a formula which echoes all through the book. They are able, the Italian says, mantenere lo stato, they're able to maintain their state. So virtu is the name of the quality that enables you to maintain your state. Maintain your state, mantenere lo stato, what does that mean? Lo stato in Machiavelli is, I think, quite deeply ambiguous. Of course, in modern Italian, lo stato just means the state. Um, and that notion is not absent in Machiavelli, I've come to think. But fundamentally what he means by being able mantenere lo stato is to maintain your state, i.e. As a, as a ruler, as a political leader. That's to say, to maintain your standing, your status as a political leader. Um, what you want to avoid is what the French at this time were already calling a coup d'état. That's to say, any strike against the état, meaning your état, your state, your condition or... Um, standing as a ruler. But if you're going to maintain your position, then obviously what you've in fact got to maintain is the jurisdictions and territories that have been given into your charge. And that, of course, brings out the other notion of lo stato. That sounds very like the state. And it's true that if you're going to maintain your state, il suo stato, you have to maintain the state, lo stato, the institutions, the jurisdictions of the state. And indeed, the very first sentence of the whole book uses this notion of state in a remark for the age, a remarkably abstract way, because he says, all the states that there have been, uh, tutti gli stati, all the states that have been, have either been principalities or republics. So notice, the notion of a state is something that could be either a principality or a republic. So it's a rather abstract notion of some set of institutions which could take different constitutional forms. So... What Machiavelli wants to say is, all right, that's your task. 
You've got to be able to maintain your state, avoid a coup d'etat, and the quality that enables you to do that is this quality, la virtu. Let me turn to the fourth and final point that I think Machiavelli wants to us to understand about this notion of virtu, but to appreciate this final point, you have to see that we are in the high Renaissance here, we're at the beginning of the 16th century, and we are in a, a scale of political values very foreign to us in a democratic society. And Machiavelli wants to say, this goal, which is the fundamental goal of princes, being able to mantener lo stato, is not the main goal of the prince. It's the fundamental one. If you can't manage to hold on to the apparatus of power, then, then you're over. There's nothing to say to you. But it isn't the goal you should be setting yourself. The goal you should be setting yourself, and here we have the high Renaissance speaking, is glory, la gloria. What you have to do as a prince is to do great things, grande cose. You've got to do great things of such a kind as will bring you glory, and so much glory now that posthumously you attain fame. Fame is posthumous, which is why you must always be polite to historians, because... <laughs> They are in charge of your fame, but they're not in charge of your glory. That is what you can aspire to. And so it's the figure of the virtuoso who gains glory, this, the figure of glory that Machiavelli wants you to focus on. Because virtuoso now would just mean someone extremely good at playing the violin in public, or, or the piano, or something like that. That would be a virtuoso. A virtuoso. But you see the connection, because when you watch these people in action, they are amazing, aren't they? Uh, and, you know, they, they, they're glorious figures. They bring the house down. Now, this discussion of glory uh, is also very much Machiavelli's theme in chapter 19, um, when he discusses Severus uh, and Marcus Aurelius, because he says both were able not merely to remain in power but to attain so much glory that they died venerated by all. Okay, there it is, as far as I can see, that's to understand this pivotal notion in the book, that if you wish to attain glory, if you wish to maintain your state, if you wish to overcome and control fortuna, the answer in every case is the same, you need this quality of your two. So there it is.